Hi, and welcome to our show, The Next Generation. I'm your host, Barry Dennison. Today's topic, the equality of homosexuals. Asking the questions, question, should Canadians conquer their fear and hate towards gays and lesbians? In cities, large and small, still prevalent in today's society, the words you faggot or you queer are fighting words, intended to provoke a violent or submissive response. And whether it's on the street, at work, or in the schoolyard, it's one person saying to the other, you're the lowest form of life. Historically, gay men and lesbians have faced systemic prejudice, whether it be witch hunts in the military in an effort to dishonor homosexuals, they have been denied employment, they have been denied housing. All in all, it seems these people whose biological sexual orientation is homosexual have been rejected by their churches, some families, and overall community. Shunned by the mainstream of society to be outcasts and judged solely on this one aspect of their life. In many cases, such discrimination has forced gays and lesbians into an underground subculture or into a closet marked by loneliness, shame, and with constant ridicule. Well, today that treatment is becoming a thing of the past, with many gays and lesbians coming out to, to their families, friends and communities to say, I'm a good person. It's how I am and I'm proud. And to also point out that accepting homosexuality for others who are will make no difference in your proud life as a heterosexual. In our show, you'll hear the, a resilient spirit from both lesbian and gay men as well as heterosexual allies from many facets of society who are but a microcosm of folks who work hard to build a new sense of community, a new sense of human equality. But also we'll be talking of situations in Canadian life about families, churches, cities, provincial and federal governments who will knowingly discriminate, raising the question, should Canadians conquer their fear and hate toward homosexual people? My first guest is Mr. Mike Fay from Central Toronto Youth Services Bureau. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of perspectives, the, the first being quite personal, that I certainly would have grown up uh, extremely homophobic, and uh, certainly as recent as 10 years ago, being homophobic in uh, being a provider of youth services in a system which is supposed to support youth, so that, that, the, that the perspective is uh, perhaps different than some who would, would have the experience. Uh, my perspective is uh, having grown, hopefully, through, uh, through education, and of course uh, being able to realize that prejudice is, uh, is simply based on ignorance and myth, and I had the opportunity to, to work with uh, some good people who were able to educate me in the, in the uh, agency in which I work and to uh, provide the, uh, the real information about uh, growing up as a lesbian or gay youth. And uh, that had allowed me to change my own personal views and uh, be considerably less prejudiced. And um, so therefore take the position to, uh, to uh, work with other heterosexual people and, uh, and challenge them on their views and certainly be able to openly challenge people who were, who were prejudiced. 
And the, the second perspective would be as the director of an agency which is a mainstream agency delivering um, uh, youth services to uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual youth in a mainstream agency in the center of the uh, largest uh, lesbian and gay community in Canada in a core funded program uh, with money provided by government, which is uh, somewhat unusual given that a lot of these services don't exist. So the perspective is one in which we uh, try to support other agencies in realizing that they have a responsibility, but they have the, also the ability if they work with those who have the education and the knowledge of how to deliver the services, they have that opportunity to, to deliver those services in mainstream. The, the young people don't necessarily have to go to some, uh, an agency that is uh, strictly identified as uh, delivering gay, uh, lesbian, or bisexual services, that everybody can make a difference uh, with the proper education and the proper uh, perspective on what the responsibility is. What is the, the what are the programs now with Central uh, Toronto Youth Services in terms of dealing with um, gay and lesbian issues? Are, are they how new are these programs? How long have they existed? And how many kids are uh, using it as as a uh, operable service? Uh, last year we served uh, 165 uh, young people in both group and individual. The, uh, support. The individual support is a counseling support provided by uh, a full-time staff um, and we, we break that out in, ter in terms of a half-time uh, equivalency. We have a, a lesbian uh, woman uh, counseling young women and we have a gay man counseling young men. The group work is um, known as the Pride and Prejudice Group, which is a magnificent title, giving us a, a great perspective on, on the issues. And uh, again, they're separated um, by gender, uh, because through the experience, we found that was the best opportunity for young people to, to come out and to learn. The, the focus of each of those services is quite different. And, um, and again, it's, uh, the funding has been provided uh, for about 12 years by the uh, Ministry of Community Social Services and so that um, they have certainly recognized the need to be providing counseling for this youth population. And as well, we uh, have uh, two people working on the uh, development of uh, resource materials, uh, books, which will uh, allow service providers to learn how to better serve these young people, and um, also providing workshop and training opportunities for, for social service providers and youth as well. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, I'm interested to, to ask later about the types of specific programs and that the gays and lesbians would, uh, would be offered at Toronto Youth, Central Youth Services, but we'll get back to you. Thank you. Our next guest is uh, chaplain of Queen's University, Mr. Brian Yaland, who has been at the university, I guess, for about six or seven years prior to that with Corrections Canada. Deals on a a wide variety of issues at the university as chaplain, um, but also is known quite widely in, in the uh, Kingston and, and Queens community as someone that gays and lesbians, well, many people, but also including gays and lesbians, can go and talk to and feel uh, accepted and equal. So welcome, Mr. Yaland, and perhaps you'd like to pick up from there in terms of what you do in, in, in your job and, and what you've heard from young men and women just starting out at university or who have been there for a while. Thanks, Barry. I think um, my own perspective is that uh, I'm a straight man and a married man and a United Church minister. I don't think I was ever homophobic. I don't think I ever had any more fear of homosexuality than I had about sexuality. And I think that leads me to say that my feeling is that uh, homophobia is in many ways a, a part of society's general phobia or fear of sexuality. Uh, I think that uh, what it reflects is that um, most of us have many, many areas of fear about our sexuality and, and uh, uh, the power of the sexual in our lives. Um, having said that, I think that when fear of homosexuality erupts into forms of prejudice, uh, it's a very difficult thing to deal with. And it's a very unfortunate thing, and it's very sad for the young people uh, who become victims of, of those kinds of prejudices. And we're all probably aware these days of how many young people there are who have faced um, uh, even suicide in their life as a result of feeling that they are different from the mainstream person in society 
and therefore feeling that they are centered out and they are unhappy and that they will be non-accepted in their life. As I meet with young people across the university campus who come to talk to me, it is often the case that uh, people bring uh, sexual issues in their life and often university is the time when a young person will, for the first time, feel not fearful of coming out or discovering that they are gay or lesbian. Uh, so that this can be an awakening time for a young person who may have hidden the fact of their sexuality to themselves and to others while they were still at home or still at, at, uh, at high school. So that's one of the things that we do deal with uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, and many people in the university deal with that. And it can be a very frightening time for young people uh, dealing with that. What is the, uh, the experience you have with uh, students, university students primarily, struggling with their sexuality and their religion? Well, that... Uh, Religion can be or may not be an issue in all of this. It's, it's sometimes um, um, a societal pressure that, uh, that a young person will feel uh, very centered out by. And then, but in many cases it is religious because uh, many religions have had as a mainstream belief an incorporated fear of uh, homosexuality. And uh, so that, that can be a very strong thing to deal with. Guilt certainly comes into this for a young person that feels that they are uh, discovering an orientation which is considered wrong or immoral, either by society or by their church or religious organization. What is your response to religious fundamentalists who say that, that homosexuality is a sin and it should be damned to hell? Um, it is one that says that you, if you're talking about Christian uh, fundamentalism, yeah, yes based on a, an understanding of what the Bible has to say, you, we'd have to get into a discussion of the biblical references here. There are references in the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, and as well references in the teaching of Paul, to, um, which include lists of what are considered abominations, or Paul's lists of those things which are considered sinful and immoral, uh, which include Hebrew words or Greek words which have a sexual meaning to them. Uh, scholars, when you look at this, uh, are, are in quite a bit of disagreement as to exactly what behaviors or what sexual issues are being discussed in those actual texts. But uh, in, in Leviticus, in the Old Testament, there are a whole list of abominations which include, seem to include, male prostitution, but they also include uh, men having sex with their wives during their menstrual period. All those things, as well as the food regulations, are all included as abominations in those texts. So I would say, along with the look, looking at Paul's texts in the New Testament, that uh, we have to be careful in our reading of those and that to simply, for ourselves, adopt a, a list of abominations uh, without looking at them or thinking about them would be a wrong thing to do. We, uh, we accepted slavery until 100 years ago because it was in the Bible, and now it's still in the Bible, but we don't accept it. So sometimes we move on. Excellent points, yes. Our next guest, <clears throat> uh, Ms. Jessica Bell of Metropolitan Community Church in both Kingston and Belleville, I believe. You can correct me on that if I'm wrong. Um, who's a former Anglican and has quite an experience in terms of the Anglican Church and being ordained uh, in that church. Or uh, what happened to you with the Anglican Church, Jessica? Well, the Anglican Church, which was, uh, I'm a cradle Anglican, I was born into the Anglican Church and always intended to become a minister in the Anglican Church. But when it was, when I acknowledged that I was a lesbian and that I had a partner of the same sex, I was told that I was not acceptable for ordination. This is still the stand that the Anglican Church takes, that you may be a lesbian as long as you don't show any signs of acting on it. Why well, was it important for you to uh, say that you were a lesbian? Um, couldn't you, you could have just gone through the uh, education process and, and uh, been quiet and, and uh, just got you, what you came for, the ordination, and, and why did you decide to, uh, to out yourself or identify yourself as a lesbian? I think because, first of all, it's extremely restricting not to be allowed to say who you are. You start having conversations with people, 
and, and you sort of stop halfway because you can't say a whole bunch of things about where you are or who you're with or what you're doing or where you're going. And the second reason certainly is that if I was to be an Anglican priest, I would not have felt honorable to have to counsel people that this lifestyle was wrong, which also would have been part of what I would have been expected to do. And see, uh, where does the Metropolitan Community Church pick up with that? That is primarily a, a gay-oriented church, am I right? We don't have, you know, you could, if, you, if you could, just explain that, because we don't have actually a church in Kingston saying Community Metropolitan Church. What, no. what is the... Uh, the Metropolitan Community Church began in 1968 in San, in San Francisco. Um, and it was the, the dream of, actually, of a defrocked Pentecostal minister, Troy Perry, who was living in San Francisco and saw the suffering of all the, the gays that were there that had been kicked out of the churches and decided that there had to be a church for these people until the other churches came to their senses and realized that they were just like everybody else. And I think that there's good news in, in January, tw sorry, J June 27th in Capital Extra, it, it's headline, Anglican Church considers apology to gays and lesbians. So hopefully we'll, uh, we'll look for that apology uh, soon. Well, it might be too little too late, but we'll hope so. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. We'll get back to you. My next guest is uh, Madeline Terzik, a uh, principal at, a, at Kingston High School. Um, welcome. And um, you've had quite an experience both as a principal and as an administrator within the Frontenac Board of Education in trying to deal with, um, with homophobia in the schools. And you're credited for bringing in an uh, anti-homophobia committee uh, uh, last year that were gays and lesbians that were staff and, and uh, police officers as well worked for you on that committee. Perhaps you're able to just give us an idea of what goes on in the schools and, uh, and more administration side later. Thank you, Barry. Uh, when Barry first invited me, I wasn't sure that I would be eminently qualified to speak about um, the pain and misery that young people feel in, in schools in Ontario. However, what I thought is I, maybe I could bring the perspective of a, a heterosexual who is perhaps a lot more aware now than, than some time ago, and I also could maybe talk a little bit about some of the improvements that have occurred. I still think there's a huge uh, amount of work to be done, which was an understatement. Uh, the question at the top of the, the uh, sheet said, should Canadians conquer their fear, hatred toward gays and lesbians? Uh, I feel it feels shocking to read that, and, and yet if we look in our hearts, we would consider that to be a valid question. And I think we'd ha have to add the word oblivion, and, and that to me is, is a, a serious problem in, in secondary schools or in schools in general. To pro provide a little context, uh, uh, last year I was seconded to the board to work on curriculum, and uh, the opportunity came up to be part of an anti-homophobia committee. Um, because of my own uh, um, relationship with students, including a young man who uh, disclosed to me, and I was the only person he had ever disclosed to till he left and went to university, but it was a, a, a very uh, important turning point in my own uh, life and understanding. And so I, I was eager to take the opportunity to become part of the anti-homophobia initiative in our board. And what we did is maybe break a little uh, ground um, by offering in-service for uh, the first target group, which would have been principals, vice principals, and uh, guidance counselors in secondary schools. And that was our, our first in-service initiative, and we're hoping to carry on that momentum at some point. Um, our time's been a little bit taken up uh, in recent months with some other initiatives uh, in this province, so uh, that timetable has been delayed. Uh, the, first, uh, the first series of workshops, I think, were, were very telling in that I, I think I learned that we have a great deal of work to do, just still at the awareness level. By the same token, we have, we have uh, broken ground in, in the sense that if you look at our own local jurisdiction, uh, in one of the schools, uh, um, uh, a support group has been born which, which offers a safe haven for young gays and lesbians. In, in the county, and that to me is just an absolutely wonderful uh, um, haven of safety for these young people, which they need incredibly. What, what I also have to say, though, is 
for those young people, at least they've had the courage. You know, I think it would take immense courage to even go to the support group. Uh, but that, that is growing. What I think is sadder is that um, young people in our schools are still, uh, who are gay and lesbian, are invisible. And, and most of them won't be the ones who go to the support group because they're, they're invisible and, and, and uh, scared to even admit to themselves that they have different feelings. And I think about my uh, teaching career, and I think about, before I went into administration, I think about my 15 years in the classroom as an English teacher, and uh, I, I wish I could apologize to any gay and lesbian students in my classes who didn't see themselves reflected in the curriculum in my classroom. It was not deliberate, it was uh, lack of knowledge. Well, we'll get back to, uh to gays and lesbians being acknowledged in curriculum, that's certainly something that I know many people are working toward. My next guest is uh, Mr. Michael McKay of Ottawa Youth Services Bureau, uh, who's a frontline social worker who deals directly with gays and lesbians. What do you say, Michael? Should Canadians conquer the fear of lesbian and gays? Well, I read that question as well, and I thought, well, yes. <laughs> yes, I think they should. Um, yeah, I work at uh, I work at Youth Services Bureau in uh, in Ottawa, and um, before I get into the, that work that I do, I should say, listening to um, the talk about school and what Madeline was talking about in the school system, it's not that long ago that I went through high school and went through 15 years of, of Catholic school in Toronto, and um, I saw both. I experienced that invisibility, and, and the odd time that an issue was raised, um, it was quickly sort of, uh, an issue was raised about gays, lesbians, or bisexual people, it was quickly sort of shoved away. Um, and, and to go through 15 years of that, it, it's, it's a, it is a difficult experience, so I mean, I'm close to the issue and I can certainly empathize uh, with the experiences of youth. Um, but the work that I do is, yeah, working specifically with gay and bisexual young males. Um, youth Services Bureau offers a whole range of services to, to youth um, over 20 years old, um, experiencing all sorts of different sorts of uh, different kinds of issues. Um, in terms of our in terms of our gay, lesbian, and bisexual, uh, and transgendered, and questioning program programming that we offer. Um, what so do you mean by questioning? Transgendered, we have an idea what transgender is, but what's uh, questioning? Well, questioning is something that we decided to 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 include. Um, simply because there are so many youth that are questioning right now and they, they might not identify as gay or lesbian or bisexual or transgender yet. Um, they certainly do fit into the, the same issues that, uh, that, a, that an identified gay youth would be experiencing. Um, so we've, we've, we've included questioning, so people, youth who are questioning their sexual orientation, definitely. Um, we, we provide individual and family and group counseling to youth, um, similar to, to Central Toronto Youth Services. There's a, an out lesbian worker, um, and then there's myself, and uh, the lesbian worker works with young women, and I work with, the, with young males in, in terms of individual work. But the, the, the great thing that we're able to offer and we're really lucky to be able to offer this is an orientation exploration group. And what that is is a 12-week group. Um, it's a closed group that um, serves usually six to eight, um, six to eight youth, and it's divided based on, on gender lines, so a young group for women and a, young, uh, a group for young women and a group for young men. And I think it's really important to have that group element. I mean, we can do individual work, and individual work is fantastic, but the group element certainly does, uh, does provide youth with uh, Developing skills around, you know, making friendships with with other peers who are who share similar experiences, and most importantly, they're able to see a reflection of themselves in that group. And it's it's amazing to see youth at the beginning of the group, and then at the end of the 12 weeks, the changes that have occurred. So, well, what are the the three pressing, just na to name three, mm -hmm. uh, primary issues that that young men and women are facing? Oh my gosh, to narrow it down to three, I mean, isolation is, is, is certainly one, um, a, a very significant one. Um, there's risks around loss, incredible risks around loss. I mean, young um, gay, lesbian, or bisexual, trans, or questioning youth are, are, are at risk of losing family, uh, losing religion, losing friends, losing school. Um, those, are, those are really significant. And the other one is, is self-harm. I mean, uh, youth... Uh, who are questioning their sexual orientation or identify as, as GLB um, are three times more likely to commit suicide uh, and follow through with that suicide um, than straight youth are. Um, and that, to me, it's a staggering statistic to look at to look at those risks and then to look at the amount of services being provided for such a risk group. It's incredible. Okay, thanks. In fact, one of the uh, uh, 
workers at Center 519 in Toronto wasn't able to attend tonight's uh, discussion owing to the fact that uh, someone on our caseload had committed suicide. And so it, it seems to be a very real and very current issue. It, it, it's, a, it's a risk we see, we see all the time. Um, we just recently did a, a youth survey and we included a question to ask if youth identified as GLBT or Q. Um, back in the spring, and we've we've redone that survey in November, and and uh, and to see to see the amount of risks, to see the homelessness rates, to see um, suicide rates, uh, to see self harm rates, it's it's incredible. I see, okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, my next guest is uh, Mr. Wesley Creechlow from Toronto, who has his PhD uh, from Ryerson. Is that correct? U of T. U of the University of Toronto. Pardon me. Um, and is the chair of the African Canadian Legal Clinic uh, in Toronto area. And um, what do you think, Wesley? Should uh, Canadians conquer their fear of lesbian and gays? Why not? Um, I guess when, I, when I, the question was asked, I, I thought about my recent work, which I just did on black gay men in Toronto and Halifax, which was my PhD dissertation. And um, my dissertation examined literally how black men live their lives within the context of black communities and what it means for them to live their lives in the context of white communities. And when I think of the issue here, that you, the question you put forward, it's hard for me not to see how race is implicated in the question that you're presenting in terms of um, to what extent, if I am bashed, am I bashed because I am black or am I bashed because I'm gay? To what extent um, does the whole notion of hate crimes um, when you talk about hate crimes being uh, uh, something that affect gays and lesbians, when you talk about a person of color, uh, does the person of color um, automatically assume that they were bashed because of, of their race or their orientation? So in, I guess my, my, my take on it is that it is very complex. Um, and it's complex enough as it is for white gays and lesbians who are bashed, and it's, and it's doubly complex for, for people of color who must negotiate constantly um, what it means to live within their own communities where hostility exists and try to live within a white gay and lesbian community where hostility also exists. So in talking about the whole notion of, um, of, of hate, I think there's some, some responsibility also too that needs to be shifted in the context of the gay and lesbian community itself, the white larger gay and lesbian community, who have hardly done any work on the whole area of anti-racism and, and cultural differences. Um, we have had a number of court challenges around issues of same-sex spousal benefits, all of which have lacked a cultural understanding or race analysis about how this will impact upon different racial minorities, for example, Muslims um, and other people who are non-Anglo. Uh, the whole concept of family and what does the concept of family mean in the context of white Anglo culture and how that was not taken up in many of the debates that have been centered around notions of, um, of, 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 of gay and lesbian rights have again excluded uh, gays and lesbians of color. So I guess for me the question is, how can we talk about this in a way that takes up differences? And then how does those differences get celebrated rather than further marginalized within a marginalized population? And you feel marginalized in, in Canadian society. I've read books where, where persons of color feel marginalized in the United States. I didn't realize what's going on in Canada. <laughs> Perhaps that's awfully naive of me. I didn't mean to laugh. Um, um, <laughs> and I would point out that not, every, not everyone would admit that. <laughs> um, marginalization is mild. I think it's, it's, it's racism. Um, to call it marginalization is an understatement. Um, what we experience on a daily basis as, as, as people of color who understand, who name and who can see racism uh, is, is only doubled by issues of sexism, is only doubled by issues of homophobia. So, you may find that people talk about the whole notions of the double oppression and the triple oppression. Um, it's not about trying to somehow uh, reduce homophobia as, as something that's not important. It's about trying to see how complex it is when one talks about these different isms that they carry with them. So to talk about anyone, the, the quest is always to, to, to somehow journey through an interrelated kind of a process that takes into account all the differences that people bring with them so that you understand the complexities, the broader issues that affect people. Uh, do I feel marginalized? No, I don't feel marginalized. I experience racism, and I think they're different issues. Well, we'll pick up on that later, yeah. okay? Thank you, Wesley. My next guest is um, Staff Sergeant uh, Mike Gobey from the Kingston Police Services. Um, welcome, Mike. Should Canadians conquer their fear and hate toward gays and lesbians? 
I guess my question back, Barry, would be it's, it's unfortunate that there, we have to even ask that question or that there needs to be a fear. Um, I guess I begin by, by thanking uh, the many brave men and women uh, that have uh, brought the issue to uh, awareness within the larger communities. It's uh, all too often, unfortunately, with a lot of the social ills that uh, many people have to be victimized and, and have to knock on the doors of large organizations like, like the police for many years. But I guess uh, the good part is that uh, groups such as police and government and other agencies are starting to, uh, are starting to, uh, to get the message. Um, so I, I have to thank those people because they're the people that come in to educate um, people like myself. Um, I think I was relating to you my, my experiences uh, as a very young person uh, in 51 Division in Toronto uh, quite a few years ago and then returning to, uh, to that area uh, a number of years ago when I had a secondment and uh, lived in, a, in the predominantly gay area in Toronto. And, uh, how my views and uh, my understanding of, of many of the issues have changed, but I really have to thank the people uh, who have helped me to understand more. Um, there's certainly a lot of way to go, but uh, with policing, I, I think uh, Bruce is going to be talking next, and the work that Bruce and Dan have done in Ottawa, uh, Metro Toronto, Toronto, Toronto Police, uh, other agencies uh, coming on board and, and understanding more about the issues. Uh, crime is certainly not a new issue. Crime has been around for a long time, but understanding motivation and realizing the impact that it has on, on the community um, at large is something new. And uh, again, uh, when we do education or when we do reactive investigations, it's really with the help of, of uh, people in the community that we can learn more. Uh, we know that most crime goes unreported, and that certainly is probably the case in hate crimes. Uh, for instance, in Kingston over the